Hey there, friends. I want to share a story with you guys that's pretty interesting. Here recently, an ATF agent, actually within the last couple of days, has resigned from the ATF. And he resigned only two years prior to retirement, or at least when he's eligible for retirement, which means a full pension. Think about that. You got a guy who spent 18 years in an organization and got a measly two years away from being able to get full pension and full benefits, and he walks away from it. It takes a pretty big deal to make a person do that. It takes kind of a, a life-changing event or a, a series of life-changing events to alter that person's course two years prior to be able to get those types of benefits. The agent's name is Brandon Garcia, worked out of the Arizona office. You may remember his name. Brandon Garcia was loosely tied to Fast and Furious. If you'll remember Eric Holder's and Barack Obama's gun running scheme where we illegally traffic firearms to Mexico only to have some of them come back into the United States and actually kill a border patrol agent with the guns that our government trafficked to Mexico illegally. Okay, Mr. Garcia was actually part of that. In fact, it appears that he was used as somewhat of a scapegoat or a fall guy in that because while they do blame him for a lot of what happened in some investigations that took place back in the uh, 20 teens, they also kind of let him off the hook. It's almost like they told him, hey dude, you're new, you're young. Um, if you want to be here for a long time, you got to take the fall for this one. So we're not going to discipline you, which <laughs> whoever gets disciplined for doing something wrong in the federal government, but we're not going to discipline you. You're going to take the fall but we're going to cover for you and you'll get promotions after that, which by the way, he is a frontline supervisor as of today. So clearly he did receive promotions over time and didn't get deemed for it within the organization. So it seems like he might've been rewarded. Brandon wrote a lengthy six page letter and I'm not, the irony is not lost on me that his name is Brandon, by the way, a six page letter explaining why he's leaving the ATF. Now I'm not going to read the whole thing and bore you. In fact, I'll probably read too much of it and I'll bore you with this, but bear with me. There are some key points in here. Keep in mind, this is a person internally who worked for the federal government for 18 years, and these are the things that he saw over the course of that time. He mentions early in his letter, I don't know what the mission really is anymore, but I don't like it. Further down, he says, we as agents are required to set aside our personal and political opinions and do our job. Why does that same standard not apply to the entire Department of Justice? Now, obviously no fan of the restrictions and lockdowns that were incurred as a result of the man-made virus. He states that, I am confident that the agents and officers regularly working violent crime and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most violent criminals on the streets are not worried about dying from COVID or if everyone is vaccinated or wearing a mask or if they can telework. He goes on to say, the government is creating this issue. The government is dividing us. Of course, none of us needed to hear that from somebody because we already see that, but it's interesting to see a person who was cashing a government paycheck say those things. We are becoming a country that focuses on extremes and all the good people in the middle are the ones suffering. Instead of being a rational voice, the government is only adding fuel to the fire. I don't feel like our leadership is fighting for the agents or for police in general. They seem to be going along with the attitude of the current administration. Why are we so afraid of educating politicians with the truth? Our agency talks a lot about developing real leaders. If our leaders are afraid or unwilling to fight back against things that they know are wrong, maybe they are not leaders. Well, clearly they're not. Because they said so, or because I said so, should never be an acceptable answer for a leader, and those phrases are never used by a real leader. A long time ago when I was a brand new patrol officer in Albuquerque, my training officer told me, if you have to say the words, I'm in charge, then you are not in charge. Our government tends to punish, shame, or pressure employees into compliance rather than motivate. We see that a lot. We see that everywhere in politics. The goal is never to reason with you. The goal is always to shame you into changing your opinion and making it like the person who is attempting to shame you. Now here's some internal stuff that interested me. In a meeting not too long ago, the deputy director told us that ATF is not aligning with either political party, which is the way it should be, but also intriguing to me that he felt the need to emphasize it. However, ATF's recent actions sure seem to align with the left. Over the last couple of years, ATF has been spending a significant amount of time talking about and changing the course of this agency to focus on the gun. 
frankly, I don't really care about investigating the gun. I care about investigating the criminal and then plucking the criminal out of society. Last year, headquarters spent pretty much the entire year talking about the vaccine and threatening termination for those who wouldn't get it. Yet the deputy director threatened to prosecute the agents for lying to a federal agent if we did not appropriately update our vaccination status in the system. Seems a bit extreme. I have never even threatened a criminal with that charge. The push was clearly political and I wanted no part of it. Goes down a little bit and says they knew they had no legal grounds, so they used the leftist tactics of shaming, excluding, and threatening into compliance. There is no telling how many agents got vaccinated for the sole purpose of keeping their jobs and their pension. Now that's sad to me. We saw that everywhere. We saw that in the airlines. We saw that in sports. We saw it everywhere. And looking back on it, so many people were intimidated. And I don't care how big and bad you are. I'm talking, people mostly get intimidated up here. It's not always here. And it's not always here. It's usually right here. They get intimidated because they get mind effed along the way. And people take advantage of that and they bully people mentally. And in many cases, like what he's talking about, so many people took an experimental thing. I don't want to say the word because it'll get this video immediately uh, demonetized or canceled or whatever. But they took this experiment and now they look back on it and I think they regret it because they realized there was no real teeth behind it, just like Brandon says right here. But nevertheless, the damage is already done. We did not become ATF agents so we could collect data, ensure firearms are in compliance, seize trigger groups, argue about what a firearm is or is not, seize firearms for reasons other than prosecuting criminals or spend countless hours inputting data to justify someone else's existence in headquarters. He's right. The original intent of that organization may have been, may have been to do the things that he's explaining here, but clearly they have evolved into some kind of hall monitoring service against people that are easier to work with, law-abiding people, rather than the criminals out there. In other words, they've taken the easy road. There's a fork in the road and they've taken the path of least resistance because sure makes my job a lot easier instead of going down this path where there's actual criminals at the end of it, but it might be a little bit harder work. So let's take the easy path instead. He says for at least the last decade, the government has focused on holding police accountable. I agree, we do need to be held accountable but everyone needs to be held accountable for their actions, not just police. Who is holding the criminal accountable? Who's holding the politicians accountable? This administration talks a lot about guns in the same sentence they talk about violent crime. However, they say nothing about holding people accountable for the crimes they commit unless it supports their agenda. When horrible tragedies occur with firearms, the left seizes every opportunity to argue for gun control and the elimination of certain types of weapon systems. However, Specifically in blue states, fewer and fewer defendants associated with gun crimes are actually sentenced to prison. Violent crimes committed with firearms are consistently pled down to nonviolent crimes and the defendant again avoids prison. We talk about it all the time. Enforce the freaking gun laws on the books. This is exactly what he's talking about. A lot of these criminals would never be on the street to do this, perform the same crimes over and over again if they were simply locked up and not allowed to plead their cases down to, oh, no prison time, because they want to get that little bitty tiny nugget of information so they can go after the next guy that they're going to arrest and then let go. What is the point? If you're wanting to let this person plead down just so you can catch the next guy, but you're gonna let both of them back out on the street anyway, why not just eliminate that and lock one of them up for good and screw catching the next guy? At least you got one off the street. In this case, when you're letting them plead down, you're letting them all back off onto the street. So you're never taking anybody off the street and they're all recommitting these same crimes again. Let's lock these people up so that we're not, don't allow them to plea down, so that we're not allow them, allowing any of them to get back out on the street and recommit all these crimes over and over and over again. How stupid is that to continue to do that same process over and over again and then blame the inanimate object? You just let the guy out that made the decision to commit that crime, yet there's a gun sitting over there in a box that you want to blame so you can cast this broad brush on every single other law-abiding American out there who happens to own the same type of gun as that. Now this paragraph intrigued me. We can probably agree that law-abiding citizens do not commit gun crime. 
I think that we can probably also agree that the majority of gun owners tend to be more conservative than liberal. So essentially, gun control will only affect law-abiding conservative citizens. Therefore, the government is only punishing the conservative population. Similarly, in the summer of 2020, rioters were allowed to burn cities, assault the police, terrorize citizens with little to no consequence. However, the chaos associated with January 6 has resulted in hundreds and hundreds of prosecutions. The vast majority of the defendants have been convicted of simply being there. They didn't even have pallets of bricks or frozen water bottles staged at the scene, let alone Molotov cocktails for them to throw at the police. Still, 18 months later, the left continues to be absolutely obsessed with it. That kind of intrigues me. Because this guy is privy to information that we are not privy to. And he sees the ridiculous, disgusting hypocrisy involved with, and I'm not taking a side on, on anything here as far as January 6th goes. I mean, anybody who did anything wrong deserves to be prosecuted for whatever reason. But he's exactly right of drawing the comparison between people who burn places to the ground and nothing happened. In fact, our own vice president offered to pay their bail to get them out of jail after burning cities to the ground. Yet we have people over here that did nothing. And, and what, what really has to kind of intrigue me and get my attention here is that he mentions the pallets of bricks. You know, we talked about that. A lot of people saw the pallets of bricks that just miraculously showed up in non-construction zones just in time for all of these things to happen. Nobody has ever explained that away. You see that they're there. We've all seen the pictures. Pallets of bricks don't just show up. They show up when it's time to actually put bricks on walls. I work in construction. I know the proximity of time when a pallet of bricks is going to show up. They don't show up in the middle of a city block where there's no construction happening. So there was definitely something going on there. Somebody paid for that. I'm not saying who. I'm not saying that they had a government seal on their check. I'm not saying who it was in any kind of way. What I'm saying is it did in fact happen. And it didn't happen in January 6th or on January 6th. So we're comparing two things that are completely lopsided. However, the... I guess the repercussions are equally lopsided in the opposite direction. He goes on to say that while typing this, I see that President Biden is completely distraught that Capitol Police officers suffered through medieval hell on January 6th. And of course, it's all Trump's fault. He continues to say you can't be pro-insurrection and pro-cop. Like the definition of vaccine... Has this administration also changed the definition of hypocrisy? Where was the support of law enforcement from the Democratic Party during the presidential campaign? For at least the past 10 years, the Democratic Party and the DOJ Civil Rights Division has consistently justified criminal behavior, advocated for de decriminalization, and scrutinized the officer's actions when an officer was assaulted. This is the equivalent of asking a domestic violence victim what they did to cause their spouse to beat them up. Wasn't there an officer involved shooting on January 6th? We sure didn't hear much about it until the left decided he was a hero. I'm not suggesting it was a bad shoot at all. I will always give the other, uh, excuse me, the officer the benefit of the doubt in a shooting. However, I am suggesting if it was a different crowd of rioters, the officer might be in prison right now. At a minimum, the liberal media would have ruined his career and the officer would have been unemployable. Later on, he says, I stand firm that guns are not the problem. The problem is we don't hold criminals accountable for their actions anymore. I have spent the majority of my career working violent crime. I learned a long time ago that you do not combat violent crime by seizing firearms. You combat violent crime by locking up violent criminals for a really long time. Not just a really long time on paper, a long time behind actual prison bars. Like we used to do it before legislators and members of the judicial system decided to neglect their oath. And finally, he states down here at the bottom, I believe in God, I believe in the Constitution, and I believe that bad guys belong in prison. The government no longer believes in any of those things. This is powerful. And I know this is an ATF agent, and we don't have very high opinions of very, uh, ATF agents. I mean, I don't. You guys clearly don't. But I've said this before, and I've, I've gotten a lot of blowback. I, in my heart, firmly believe that everybody at the ATF there's got to be somebody that's decent there. I understand how now, with what he's saying in this letter, it kind of validates what I've been saying. That people probably enter this job, maybe straight out of college or you know, straight out of whatever school. Enter this job because it was a job. 
jobs were not always as plentiful. I mean, we've got people sitting on couches in record numbers right now. Uh, that's not always been the case. So maybe they took these jobs because it was just a job. Now, I don't think many of us would have taken these jobs with the ATF, but nevertheless, they were probably good, high-paying jobs. You got to figure when you get a job with the federal government, it's kind of a cake job. You know that it's easy. You know that you can't get fired from it. You got to really do some bad stuff to get fired from the federal government. And the thing is, you know dirt on other people. So even if you do bad stuff, like we see a lot, you still can't get fired. So you could be a total screw up and maintain a position within the federal government. And that's probably another draw, another attraction to people wanting these jobs. So what happens is you get people in there that probably are not evil, twisted, and nasty like this woman who was taking pictures of the uh, of black metal firearms and then smarted off and threatened them or these jackasses that were going door to door trying to bully this guy with guns. Those types of things like that, those are the evil people. Those are the bad people. But I firmly in my heart, and I guess it's because I look at good in a lot of people, believe that there, there's got to be some good people, some decent people at the ATF. And you know what's happening? They're leaving. They're leaving because they see and are witnessing the same things that we are seeing and witnessing, and they're done. They're walking away from it. So I think we're going to see more of Mr. Brandon Garcia soon. Uh, this guy's not just walking away from 18 years, two years away from getting full retirement pension with nothing lined up. My guess is the comment that he puts right here, I, I will always fight for good and I will always fight for law enforcement. Um, then he's, oh, I'm sorry, right, right above that. Since I can no longer do this job the way I think it needs to be done and have the appropriate level of success, then it is time for me to fight this fight from a different angle. That tells me he's got something else planned and it may be something that benefits us on the Second Amendment side because I truly believe based on a lot of what he said in here that this guy does align himself with the Second Amendment community. Look for Mr. Brandon Garcia to probably make that shift over full time into the Second Amendment community somewhere. It might be from one of the gun rights organizations or something like that. But I don't think we've heard the last from him. And I think this is a good thing. Now we finally have someone who was an 18-year mole, if you will, who saw the sauces being made within the ATF. And now he can take that data and move it on. Now, naturally, he's going to be... Um, Everyone's going to say that nothing he said was accurate and all that. They're going to try to say that everything was a lie. doesn't matter. We're getting it from this guy, and I think this is going to be some interesting stuff from him that we're going to hear about the ATF coming down the road. So keep an eye out for this, guys. We